Throne, Epotheos, and Thelia, Spiritus Sancti. O Master who loves mankind, illuminate our hearts with the pure light of your divine knowledge, and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of your holy scriptures. Install in us also the fear of your blessed commandments, that we may overcome all carnal desires, entering upon a spiritual life, and understanding and acting in all things according to your holy will. For you are the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ God, and to you we give glory, together with your Father and your all holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever, and in the ages of ages. Amen. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us. St. Bojami, pray for us. St. Nicodemus, 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 pray for us. St. St. Mark of Heaven. St. Photon is the Samaritan woman who was enlightened by Christ. Do you know that? No. Yes. What's the name? All right. Send in the Bible. Patience. Yes. She's right in that chapter before if you've done your homework. All right. I put up here our, our, what we're going to cover today, hopefully, and what we're going to cover next week, hopefully. Now, here's the thing. I spoke with one of the gentlemen here today uh, during the week, and I said, how was the Bible study last night? This was, you know, last week, the day after. And uh, he says, he says, well, it was good, but, you know, it's a little slow. What? What? So, what? So, hold on, hold on. So then, hold on. One of the gentlemen that's here today, you can, you can attack him later. <laughs> so then I, I, I talked to one of our other friends, and I said, oh, how was the Bible study last week? And she said... It's good, but you know, it's pretty fast. <laughs> so then I spoke with a third person who is not here tonight, and she says, it was great. The speed was just right. Oh, okay. So I thought about it, and I thought, well, then I'm going to just the perfect speed then, right? And then I, I kept thinking, I said, no. I said, that's not the case. Here's the problem. If someone really knew the text well, like was really familiar with the text, not the commentary on it, but familiar with the text itself, no matter how slow I went, it wouldn't be slow enough, right? Because there's always more questions. <laughs> the, problem, the problem is you're saying we're not reading it at home. So well, well, it, see, she always jumping ahead. <laughs> and, and then, but here's the thing, is that I noticed last week as we were going through different texts and I go back to John and start reading it, and then people were confused whether I was in John or not. And there's, no, you know, the thing is, I, I'm trying, I do my best to try to give you guys good, you know, pieces of good commentary and tying them together and making an organic whole. But there's no way that I can provide for you familiarity with the text, right? And familiarity with the text is ten times more important than any commentary, right? Because if you're familiar with the text, then as you're thinking about it, suddenly the insights are going to come to you. And okay, so I just say that because, and and, oh, and my fault is I haven't been telling you what to read. Whenever I don't tell you what to read, and we're doing like a gospel, just read the next chapter, okay? But uh, anyways, I'll do a better. I'll try to do better and tell you what to read for the next week. But you know, it's just. Even if you read it one time, at least you know the storyline and what comes one after the other. And then as we're talking about it, it's easier to deal with, you know? Yes? I know, I know you guys are busy. I'm busy. Just decide on your own speed and leave people alone. Yeah. And that's probably the right thing. Yeah. Are you guys hot? Yeah. Yes. yes. No. Uh, Poor lady's over there. chapter 3 is really a distraction. It's not very helpful, right? Because if we start with verse 23, and we read it in rhythm, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs which he did. And what do we say about that? Is that good or bad? Yeah, they're, they're, they're believing on the level of the miracle, which is a beginning, but it's not the fullness of faith in what he says. And that is going to be it. To put your faith in Jesus Christ and his word. Okay? They believed in his name when they 
they saw the signs and did. But Jesus did not trust himself to them, because he knew all men, and he did no one to bear witness of man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And the man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born anew, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So what's Jesus basically saying? Pharisees, Nicodemus says, We know who you are. And Jesus responds by saying what? No, you don't know who I am. Because you're judging upon the level of human judgment. Okay? The Nicodemus and the Pharisees are trying to judge who our Lord is based upon their own faculties, their own natural level. Okay, and we talked about those two levels, right? And they're failing to really grasp who he is. What do they see? What do they see? Yeah, maybe at best a miracle worker. Maybe at best, okay? They're seeing a man standing in the flesh. Okay? But they're not seeing what is inside that body. They're not seeing the fullness of who Christ is. Yes, they see a man, but they stay on that level. And if they don't ascend, if they don't um, entrust themselves to Christ, they will never see what he is seeing. They'll remain seen on that natural level. Okay? Verse 4. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And remember that, oh, I forgot one announcement. Um, I, here it is. I would like to get a group together to go to Santiago de Compostela to make the pilgrimage for eight days to the mountains in Spain in September. In early September. Okay? And if you're interested, I've been and I've done the pilgrimage, and so I would be able to lead it and, and uh, you know, kind of it's kind of a, a, a more of a maybe a young person type thing because it's kind of hard for we would be walking about 20 miles a day with we all a heavy <laughs> but you can come if you want in fact I'll carry your bag for you I know I carry two bags but I carry my wife's bag before or after she's your wife before that's what she's your wife we were just friends and uh, yeah alright um Truly, you cannot see the kingdom of God unless you were born again. Born, remember, onothen. And remember, onothen has two meanings. What are those two meanings? Born. To be born what? Again. Again and? From above. Again and from above. Okay, and remember, John is always going to be right on these two levels. Okay? And again, that level of seeing, right? Do they see only the flesh, or do they see the divinity within the flesh? Okay? And so he intentionally has this ambiguous phrase. Jesus uses this ambiguous phrase to draw out and show for us the problem with Nicodemus. Because just after verse 3, when he says, Unless one is born on of then he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? level, born again. Okay? And so, notice, Jesus then steps down and he explains what he was saying before in verse 5. He explains verse 3 with verse 5. Jesus answered, Truly, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Okay? So what does it mean to be born on of them? To be born from above, it means to be born of water and the Spirit. Okay? And again, we get um, a frame or the inclusio that we had seen before in the text with the, the Lamb of God. Do you remember the inclusio in the frame? You get a similar frame here, a literary structure. Okay? Jesus repeats himself. If you look at verse 3 and verse 5, there are repetitions. Okay? To be born out of them, to be born again, to be born of water and the Spirit. It's a repetition. And in the middle of that, if you remember an inclusio or a frame, the, the frame is there to tell you what's going on inside. Okay? And what's going on inside is the truth about who Nicodemus is and where he's at. Okay? 
okay? Does that make sense? So verse 4 is framed by verse 3 and 5. That which is, verse 6, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Okay, this, this gets into that, again, that, that uh, double, um, whatever, the two levels that, that John's writing on. Okay, and you could put here, okay, flesh and spirit. Okay, uh, creation and law. What else? Nature and grace. Yeah, nature and grace. Okay. Now, is does John think this is bad and evil and of no use and no good at all for us? No. 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 Okay, the entire point of the gospel is that we who are born of the flesh become born again or born out of them, born from above, that our, that our flesh receives the Spirit of God, that we can be called children of God again. Okay? It's a key, it's extremely important that we understand that this is not bad. That the entire gospel is that this has to be informed by this. That the Spirit makes the flesh what it's supposed to become. Okay? That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born on of them, to be born anew or born again. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know whence it comes or whither it goes. Notice he's going right after Nicodemus. Because Nicodemus is saying, I, we know, right? He's saying, you do not know whence it comes or whither it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Okay, does anyone catch an interesting uh, play on, on words going on there? Possibly. We're talking about spirit and wind. Yeah. Okay, so what's, man, what's the play on word? What's going on here? What's it's he doing? It's the same word. It's the same word in the Hebrew, right? So our Lord uses ambiguous word, anothen, Okay? And it's followed up with in the Greek pneuma, which also is ambiguous. Okay? Leaving Nicodemus to try to discern what he's talking about. And, and what Peter's saying there, some of you know, in Hebrew, uh, ruach, or in the uh, in Greek and uh, <coughs> I'm missing a letter. Yes, you. Is there a U there? I don't know. I don't know. Oh, there we are. E. Is it U E? Okay. Can be translated as wind, and it can be translated as spirit. I should have actually done that opposite so that my thing would have followed here. But that's okay. Alright? And again, Nicodemus struggles to understand what Christ is talking about, which exposes Nicodemus' own lack of insight. Okay? Nicodemus has seen Christ on the natural level. And he's willing to follow him on that level, and that's it. And what Christ is trying to do is to bring Nicodemus to understand his own lack of insight. Okay? And his own lack of faith. His own lack of ability to give himself. Okay? And it's only when Nicodemus comes to that realization that he will realize the need to be born again of water and the Spirit. Okay? Questions? Yes? No? I have an yes. a sentence here that I think that would interest me anyway. Uh, how can that be possible that as you have been this? And Jesus says, you are a teacher in Israel and you do not know these things. Mm -hmm. I thought that was yeah, why is that interesting? pretty good right there. Yeah. <laughs> Who's Nicodemus in? What was his background? Uh, He's a Pharisee. Pharisee. And the Pharisee is what? So they're supposed to know a lot. They're supposed to know the law, and what else? The prophecy. Okay, but what else? What are the Pharisees big on? Being cleansed. And for the Jews to be cleansed is to go through this spiritual rebirth. Okay? And Nicodemus exposes that he's so far even disconnected from his own 
understanding of what he's supposed to be doing as a Pharisee. Okay? It's almost as though the Pharisees are disconnected. Christ shows their full, that they're, they're now living on the level of simply law and rule and not even understanding why they were, they're into to ritual cleansing in the first place. Okay? If, for anyone, to have, of all the people, to understand what Christ is talking about here, it would have been Nicodemus. Right? And yet he, he can't understand it. Um, St. Augustine. Nicodemus had not yet savored this spirit in this life. He knew but one birth, which is from Adam and Eve. That which is from God and the church he did not yet know. He knew only the paternity which engenders to death. He did not yet know the paternity which engenders to life. Whereas there are two births, he knew only one. One is of the earth, the other of heaven. One of the flesh, the other of the spirit. One of mortality, the other of eternity. One of male and female, the other of God and the church. Okay? This, this whole idea of being born again ties right back for us into the um, prologue, doesn't it? You remember in the prologue, when I pointed out what phrase in the prologue? Yeah, I know the prologue by heart. Okay, remember I told you it's the whole, it's the whole gospel in a nutshell. What's said in the prologue? All right, turn back to it. Turn back to it. Verse, verse 10. I'm saying that this whole point of being born again is already revealed in the prologue in, in a nutshell. Okay? Verse 10. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and yet the world knew him not. He came into his own, and his own people received him not. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, but of God, to be born on earth then. Okay? And they become children of God. But those that are not born on earth then are those that have not received his word and not believed in his name. Is it on in verse 13? No, I'm just saying, I'm, I'm saying, yeah. Okay, to be born of God, to be born of, from above. Okay? Um, Yes. How do we know that the deal said it's reason for coming to Jesus? How do we know his reason for coming to Jesus? Well, sure. I mean, we assume here that he's the uh, class dunce who's asking the questions and revealing his ignorance. Mm -hmm. Everybody else understands this, and it's just a lot of results beforehand. What do you do? Maybe he's the only one who's thinking about this and actually asked the question in the first place, and everyone else is just the one who's heard. I mean, that might be a good point. Do I mean, should we read Nick? I think what you're saying is, should we read Nicodemus completely in the negative? Yeah. yeah, and I say no. In fact, it's going to be shown here that in Nicodemus is the beginning of the transformation which has to happen in each one of us. Okay, and in John to each one of the people that we meet in the gospel. Okay? Um, okay, how's this? Is that sure. Okay. I'll read you just I was just thinking this might this might uh, answer some of that in Carson. Formerly Nicodemus has has uh, Formally, Nicodemus has not yet asked anything, though the implied question seems to be something like, who are you then? We know you are a teacher from God, but are you more? Are you a prophet? Are you the Messiah? But Jesus' words are more than a response to a merely implied question. The fundamental presupposition behind the opening sally of Nicodemus, as behind the demand for a sign, is the ability of the, is it interlocutor? Yeah, I think I was trying to yeah, yeah. Yeah. to assess the evidence Jesus may care to advance. Nicodemus, like other Jews, wants to set up a criteria by which to assess who Jesus is. Jesus rejects the priority of Nicodemus and radically questions his qualifications for sorting out heavenly things. Nicodemus claims he can see something of who Jesus is in the miracles. Jesus insists that no one can see the saving reign of God at all, including the display of miracles, unless born again. Okay? So, I'm not sure that gets at your answer, but I think in Nicodemus there's a lot more going on than just the words of the text are saying. They're an indication of what's going on. 
Okay, and if we know the gospel, we know the theme of the gospel, that Christ is the light of the world, and the world is in darkness in the prologue. Right? And Nicodemus comes in darkness, but he's come to the light. And now he's in a conversation with the light. Things are looking pretty good. Okay? Are you saying that there's a lot more going on in this person, or that, like, literally, he's representing another whole, like, I'm trying to figure out what you're saying in terms of there's a lot more going on? I'm saying that in the text, we could just read it through on the surface level. But if we dig at it a little bit, Nicodemus, he's a representation of the world. He's a representation of the Pharisees. He's, there's a lot more going on inside him. Yeah. If we know the themes of the gospel of light and darkness. Okay? Regarding this flesh and spirit contrast. A significant contrast in John. Flesh represents all that is natural, earthly, and human. While spirit signifies all that is supernatural, heavenly, and divine. The distance once separated these realms has been bridged by Jesus Christ, whose flesh is an instrument that conveys the life and spirit of God to the world. Okay, referencing the prologue of verse 14. Okay, that in Christ's flesh is revealed the glory of God. And so Christ becomes this bridge now for man to pass from the flesh to the spirit. Okay? And again, it's not that the flesh is bad or evil or worthless, but that the whole point is that the flesh is not enough. It must be informed by the spirit to make it really what it's supposed to be. Okay? Am I being in a dead horse? A little bit. Hanson? I'm going to be slow. It's the answer that the same as going to be Verse 9. Well, let's go to verse 8. The wind blows where it wills, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know whence it comes or whither it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus says, said to him, How can this be? Notice Nicodemus is struggling, and he's struggling to understand even as our Lord is like coming lower and lower to him, and he's still struggling to understand. Okay? How can this be? And Jesus answered, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand this? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Notice the connection of receiving the word of God, right, in the, in the prologue, right? Those who receive the word become children of God, okay? But he is not receiving our Lord's word. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? That's a tough, tough sentence, and all we can say is we can guess on what he's talking about. Okay, what do, we, what do you guys think? What's he talking about? What's the earthly thing and the heavenly thing there? He mentioned the wind. Okay, so possibly the wind or being born again. What do you guys think? said that that's not just flesh and flesh, that was the spirit, the spirit. Okay. So I told you about the thing that was just flesh and flesh, and you don't understand that. Well, what is it about the flesh that he said that Nicodemus doesn't understand? It's necessity. Uh, it's need for the spirit. But to be born again in the spirit. Okay, I think that's a good... You guys all hear that? Yeah, verse 6, right? So, that was Read us verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Okay, so, so answer, say again what you're saying. Uh, that, uh, what, what, is it, what is it that Nicodemus doesn't understand on the, on the level of, of, of the natural level of the flesh? He doesn't understand the incarnation. That seems pretty heavy duty to me, like, uh, right? That's, it seems like things from above. But I think, no, I think you might be right. First of all, what's Nicodemus looking for? What's Nicodemus coming and looking for? What's he want to see? Material, physical answers. I don't know, some ruler of the Jews. He wants to know who Jesus is. Yeah, he wants to know who Jesus is. And, and implied in that, who's he looking for? Messiah. The Messiah, the one sent from above. He wants to know the things of God. 
Okay? And Jesus says to him, Nicodemus, you cannot find these things out. You cannot understand them. You cannot, notice what he says, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So you're saying he doesn't, he doesn't at this point even understand the law, and the law will be what compared to the flesh. So because he doesn't understand the law, then he's not even going to understand the supernatural. That 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 might be a very good point, and, but let's give him. Let's even let's say Nicodemus understands the law to a certain extent. Okay, Nicodemus is struggling to understand baptism, being born again. Yeah. Right. And we That's could. That's something natural, right? I mean, it is in the law, but it's not. Yeah, it is, and it's not. I'm not saying that my answer is exactly the right answer, but I, it's the best one I've I've heard, and that is that baptism and the sacraments are in a sense earthly. There are there are earthly way or highway to the spiritual. Because they're the sign of the thing. Exactly. And he's struggling to see the sign. He's struggling at that level. Okay? To understand baptism. To understand being born again. But what is he looking for? He's looking to find out who Jesus is. In other words, he's trying to get and look into Jesus' eyes and see what's behind that flesh. And Jesus is saying, stop. You're judging me on your level. You must first understand and be born here in, in this way. Okay? To die to the flesh. To be born again from above. And then and only then will you start to see who I am. Okay. Just, go ahead. Okay. So he has to have, he has to be baptized in order to have the grace, to have the virtue of faith, so they understand what he's more acceptable to saying. Yeah. I mean, it might be a little bit of a stretch, but I'm saying that's the best answer. It's a difficult sentence. Okay. But I think that's our the the best way to understand it. That's, that, that's what Augustine was saying. Um, I just, I was, uh, something. That, yeah. Yes. I mean, he wasn't commenting on that exact verse, but yeah. Yeah. Verse 12, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Okay, so Nicodemus, you're not going to get there without, right? You're not going to ascend to see the things of heaven without me who came here to get you. Okay? And then we get a change in the text in verse 14, right? Suddenly he switches, right? Carrie, read us verse 14 and 15. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Okay. Why is it that... You guys remember that? Do you remember that story? Yes, no? No? Yes. All right, let's turn to Numbers chapter 21. Does anyone have an idea why all of a sudden Christ turns to that story? Yes. Why? Well, because he's just said, you can't, basically, 13, you can't understand this without me. And yeah. then he moves into saying what he's going to do in order to save them. But why right now? What is it about the serpent in the desert that is so helpful to Christ and Nicodemus right now? Okay, there's something going on about the story of the servant that is that our Lord sees as helpful as a parallel. Just as, right, that happened, so it's going to happen now. Okay, so in order to understand what our Lord's talking about, we've got to go back and become familiar with what's going on in Numbers. Okay? I didn't, there we go. Numbers 21. When the Canaanites, uh, I'm sorry, who wants to read? Susan, uh, Peter, you want to read? Oh, you got your, your uh, carry you read for us. Starting on there. Chapter, verse 1. When the Canaanite, the king of Arad, who lived in the Negev, heard that Israel was coming by way of Atharim, he fought against Israel and took some of them captive. Then Israel made a vow to the Lord and said, If you will indeed give this people into our hands, then we will utterly destroy their towns. The Lord listened to the voice of Israel and handed over the Canaanites, and they utterly destroyed them in their towns. So the place was called Hormah. From Mount Hor, they set up by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? 
for there's no food and no water. I need to test this miserable food. <laughs> then the Lord yes. <laughs> you heard it a little bit with humor. I mean, <laughs> they say we have no food, and then they say we <laughs> detest this worthless food. And what's the worthless food? <laughs> the manna. Okay? And they just accuse God of bringing them out to die in the wilderness, to starve to death. And in fact, he fed them. Right? All right. And before we go on, what did they just accuse God of? What did they just made him out to be? Deserter. Well, worse than a deserter. deserter. Right. What kind of person hauls somebody out in the middle of the desert in order that they should die? An evil one. An evil one. A murderer. We could say the evil one. Yes? Who is the one who seeks the death of mankind but the devil, the serpent? Okay? He is the one that brought death to mankind in the beginning. And so they make God their Savior out to be the one who brought death to them. The devil. The serpent. Verse 5. And the people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of, the, of Egypt to die in this wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we loathe this worthless food. Then the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. It's interesting. They accuse God of being the serpent, right? And as soon as they make him out to be the serpent, the one who's dwelling in their midst, suddenly this revelation of all these fiery serpents around them appears, and they become a source of death to them. Okay? And the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned, for we have spoken against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord that he, that he take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a pole. And everyone who is big, who sees it, shall live. So Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a pole. And if a serpent bit any man, he would look at the bronze serpent and live. And a side note, there's a, we got a problem with our understanding of graven images because God commands an image to be not only made, but looked at, adored in some way, in faith, so that they receive life. That's a side note. We can talk about it another time. What's that? So what happens? First of all, who is the source of life? Who is the one that makes Israel live? God. God. And so what does he say? Put a fiery serpent on a pole and lift it up. And those who look at it and believe and repent will live. Why do you think he does that? Why? I mean, it's all, it's all, it's all kind of screwy and uh, topsy turvy. It's like, you know? It's like he's having them like worship. Is he testing them? I think he's testing them. Who is the one that heals them? God. Who is the one that gives them life? God. And what have they just made God out to be? The serpent. Yeah, yeah. The serpent. Okay. So God makes the serpent look good? No. no, it doesn't make him look good, but they have to look upon the serpent, repent for what they have just made God out to be. So it's kind of reminding them of their sin. They look upon the one who makes them live, right? But then when they look upon him, they see what they have accused him of being. Okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. well, uh, I think Washington Post not long ago, last year, I think they did a survey and uh, see how many people believe in God. Majority of people believe in God, uh -huh. but also majority of people do not believe that there is evil. Right. So if you don't believe in evil, how do you believe in God? Okay. Make sense? Just like if you don't believe that, that you know, there's evil and all servant, how right. do you believe in God? Right, so you're saying that, that he uses God. evil and the serpent in a, as a way to bring them to faith. Right. And you're right. Okay, but notice that the way he uses it is exactly what they've accused him of being. In a sense, they lift 
up an image of what they've made God out to be, they must accept what they've made God out to be, repent for what they have done, and only then see him rightly and live. I'm trying to get the grasp of this whole technological thing going on here, I think. With, with John? Yes, this and, and, well, and Jesus, I have to be lifted up just like the serpent. Okay, let's go back to, let, let's go back, okay, let's go back to John then. We're supposed to be going much faster than this. <laughs> We're going at the right speed. <laughs> Okay, Nicod- verse 9. Nicodemus said to him, How can this be? Jesus answered, Are you a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand this? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know, we bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things, and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from, the, from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Go ahead. So it was like man called God man, so now they have to repent for calling him that. Like they, they looked at God and they judged him on a, a human level. Like in John? Like yeah, how no, is Jesus I, man? Yeah, they, they, he's, right. he, like Nicodemus is saying, like, I know, and he's judging on his manly level, right? His okay. His human level. All right. And God's like, okay, well, now you're going to have to put me up on this human level, and you're going to have to look at Except me. Except me. And, and okay, yeah, and you're sure. on the right track. They accuse him of blasphemy later. So right. that would really... Yeah, you're on the right track. you got to go further. It's not just of accusing Jesus to be a man, because Jesus is a man. Okay. Not only are they make him a criminal, who makes him a criminal? Who is the one that accuses him? The Pharisees and the rulers of the Jews. They're the ones that are going to make Christ out to be a thief and a criminal. One who is seeking the destruction of Israel. And Nicodemus and the Pharisees will only receive life. They will only get what Nicodemus is looking for. When they look upon the one whom they have crucified, accept the fact that they have made him out, that their Savior made him out to be a thief, a criminal, and a worker of the devil, only then will they be healed of their sin. Okay? It goes also with us, too. Right? Because, as is commonly said, our sins nail him upon the cross. He died for our sins. Okay? And so we also have to come to the cross of Christ to look upon what we have made our God out to be. Repent of what we have done and be healed of our sins. I think these Pharisees are thinking they're going to lose their positions too if this Jesus takes over and they're going to lose their they were they were going to lose their jobs I think yeah and, and let's, Nicodemus is now a representative of the Pharisees for us and I think we can start to say what's going on behind the text that's not being told to us in the in the words okay with Numbers twenty one behind us in, in our background what can we say about the Pharisees. It's not just that Nicodemus is coming to him and trying to find out who Jesus is. There's some serious demonic activity going on. There's some real accusations about who Jesus is going on behind the text. And it hasn't come out yet explicitly, but it's there implicitly. Okay, did you see that? All right. It seems like kind of a stretch. I don't know. Can you explain that more? That with Numbers 21 behind us, right, is a background... We have God, we have Israel wandering in the desert of unbelief, accusing God of being really what the devil is. And now Jesus calls that story to the forefront for us and says, hey, I'm going to have to be lifted up. And we know he's going to have to be crucified, put to death. Okay, so behind the scene, in the scene, is going on for us a whole subplot or sub-story taking place that's actually driving this whole text. Yeah, no, sorry, I was just going to that. I was yeah. pushing, you said that there's something demonic in the Pharisees, and I was wondering, can you explain Yeah, that, that is 
history, there's something in, going demonic going on in Israel, right? In Numbers 21. Well, I guess, what do you mean by demonic? All right, I mean, it's like demonic. There's something evil and sinful going on. Okay, sinful. I wasn't sure if you meant literal possession. No, no, no. no. I'm no. sorry. All right. There's something stepping during the state of sin and, and, and accusing God of all sorts of bad things. So you're saying that we should use Numbers 21 as almost an analogy to what's going on here, right? What's going on right implicitly. Now. And, I'm, and I can promise you because I've read ahead. <laughs> it's going on. All right. All right. We get now. Let me just look at my notes to make sure I haven't. Uh, yeah. All right, we get now to a kind of a classic text in John where all of a sudden we, he becomes reflective. Okay, in this state, in this situation, it's Jesus who now goes on this kind of a tangent, or not a tangent, it's very much tied to the text, but he just starts a monologue. Okay? And it's very much tied to the text, and now that we have certain tools, we'll be, we're going to be able to understand it. Verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God sent the son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already. Because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. Why? Because believing is receiving. And when I receive Christ, I am united to him. And if I don't do that, I am not united to the one who saves my soul. And therefore, I am condemned already. And this is the judgment. That the light has come into the world. And men loved darkness rather than light. Okay? you got Nicodemus standing in this whole picture, coming in darkness. He comes to the light. Okay? For uh, 19. And this is the judgment of light that's coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light. Everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come to the light. But who in our story has just come to the light? Nicodemus. Nicodemus. Lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does what is true comes to the light, that it may be clearly seen that his deeds have been wrought in God. Just as much as the Pharisees are standing behind this story, the conversion of Nicodemus is standing behind this story. And Nicodemus is going to appear for us two more times in the Gospel. Okay? We have seen the beginning. He stands there in the. He's in darkness. He stands in the place of, the, of light. Okay. He stands in the presence of light. Pretty soon, he's gonna. St- we're gonna start to see him going through a conversion. And when we come to the end of the gospel, he is going to be there at the crucifixion. Okay. Having gone through full conversion and faith in our Lord. Oh, could we? Have yes. Alright, I'm going to read really fast. I'm going to say one thing and then, and then we're going to get through into verse chapter 4 and start the Samaritan one. After this, Jesus and his disciples went to the land of Judea. There he remained with them and baptized. John also was baptizing at, a- at Anon near Salim because there was much water there and people came and were baptized. For John had not yet been put into prison. Now a discussion arose between John's disciples and Jews over purifying, and, and a Jew over purifying. What kind of, who do you think that is? It's probably a Pharisee, okay? Um, Andy, do you have your what, Bible? You want to keep reading? Verse 25. Now a dispute arose between the disciples of John and a Jew about ceremonial washing. So they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, the one who is with you across the Jordan, to whom you testify, here he is, baptizing, and everyone is coming to him. John answered and said, No one can receive anything except what has been given him from heaven. You yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah, but that I was sent before him. 
So Jesus is shown to me who? In the gospel. The bridegroom. Okay? Who has come to take his bride. Okay? And we talked about that before in, in relation to at the, at the wedding of Cana. Right? And the Mark commentary has a nice comment. And it says, John the Baptist is speaking in a symbolic way here. After this dialogue of the prophets, our Lord himself does the same thing. The bridegroom is Jesus Christ. From other passages in the New Testament, we know that the church is the, described as the bride. This symbol of the wedding expresses the way Christ unites the church to himself and the way the church is hallowed and shaped in God's own life. The Baptist rejoices to see the Messiah has already begun his public ministry, and he recognizes the infinite distance between his position and that of Christ. His joy is full because he sees Jesus calling people and then following him. The friend of the bridegroom, according to Jewish custom, refers to the man who used to accompany the bridegroom at the start of the wedding and play a formal part in the wedding celebration, the best man. Obviously, as the Baptist says, there is a great difference between him and the bridegroom who occupies the center stage. Okay? The, the best man, or the friend of the bridegroom in Jewish custom, was the one who dealt with all of the aspects of the feast. He had another title, the steward of the feast. He made sure that the party ran smoothly. Okay? We already ran into a steward of the feast, right? Back at the wedding at Canaan. So some have, some have commented, it may be, that John was there at the wedding at Cana. Okay? And he was the best man. And he is the one that tasted the wine and saw the whole thing take place. Okay? Also, he's calling out for us this image of the bridegroom. And again and again in the gospel, John is going to call people, just like he is, Jesus is going to call people, just like he called Nicodemus. And they are going to have that relationship with him of the bridegroom and the bride. And we're about to run into a story where that takes place again. Okay? Verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth, and of the earth he speaks. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. He who receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true. For he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for it is not by measure that he gives the Spirit. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. He who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God rests upon him. Now when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. What do you think about that? He's running. <laughs> Why do you say that? Because, I don't know. Where is Galilee? Where the Pharisees are. Where is Galilee in relation to Judea? North. 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 Right? And the, and the Jews, the rulers of the Jews, are in Jerusalem, in Judea. And so they find out that Jesus is growing this movement behind him. And so what does Jesus do? He gets out of town. Why? He's scared. <laughs> yeah, it's not safe. Because the Pharisees and the rulers of the Jews clearly are not... I mean, otherwise, Christ would have been staying in Judea, making a name, or, you know, getting this following, going the Pharisees would have come to them. But there's something going on very much wrong with the rulers, with the Pharisees, right? Now, sorry, now when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making more disciples than John, he got out of town. Yeah. Why did Jesus did baptize Why didn't Jesus um, why didn't Jesus baptize? I don't have a comment. I should have a comment on that commentary. Any thoughts? Okay. 
student training, training sessions. I think I should get a comment on, I'll get a commentary on this from the fathers, but here's uh, what I would say off the top of my head. Um, uh, that is, what is baptism? What is that? What's that? A dying and a rebirth, a resurrection, the two parts of it, water and the spirit, right? Did, did John, when he baptized, give people the spirit? No. no. What aspect did he give them? Water. The water, the death. He prepared them on a natural level for what Christ was to, was to, bring, was to bring on a supernatural level. Right? Did but, Christ bring the spirit at this point, or is it not until after the resurrection? Well, first... <laughs> well, Jesus has the spirit of God, right? No, I know, I know that, but I'm it's wondering, just, like, is this... I yeah, no, you're right. It's similar, it's similar, I think, I think we understand similarly with the Last Supper, the Mystical Supper. Okay. Okay? That there is the revelation of the Spirit, and yet man awaits the reception of the Spirit. Because, especially in baptism, the death and resurrection of Christ, baptism is simply the sacramental way of entering into the mystery of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Baptism at this point was simply that preparation for the resurrection. Okay? And they awaited the resurrection for the fullness of the effects of the giving of the Spirit. Okay? The Spirit had been given to man in Jesus Christ, but the sharing of that gift with all of mankind had to await the resurrection okay? and man's baptism into that mystery. Is that yes? Yes, will give us something if he's got it in a second. Okay, real quick, we've got... Um, let me start with you guys. We started like five minutes. No? Okay. Uh, I won't go. I won't go very long. Although Jesus Himself did not baptize, but only His disciples. Verse three. He left Judea and departed again to Galilee. He had to pass through Samaria, so He came to the city of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Okay. First of all, what is this? Where is this field that that, that uh, Jacob gives to his son? Yeah, but where is it in the Bible? Right? When you read that text, that's what you got to do. You got to go find it out. So turn to Genesis. 33. Stop reading your comments. Commentary. Right. <laughs> you're right. You're right. I'm just kidding. All right. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. She says, it, she says it at the foot, foot of Mount Ebal. Okay, in her commentary. It's true. Okay. Genesis, what did I say? Did I say? Genesis chapter 48. Is it 33? The first reference is in 33. Genesis 48. Verse. This is just before Jacob dies when they go into Egypt. Remember, he gives his blessings? It's just before the blessings. So he says um, in verse 21, 48 verse 21. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die, but God will bring, will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your father. Moreover, I have given to you rather than to your sons one mountain slope, which I took from the hand of the Amorites with my sword and with my bow. Okay? One mountain slope. You got a little footnote on that on that word slope? Shoulder. Okay. Ah, we got a couple of different things. Shoulder. I got shoulder. Okay. Shoulder. Which just is what? One mountain slope. The word slope or shoulder, same thing, right? Okay, what else do you have? Portion. Yeah. Shechem. Okay. In Hebrew, the word is shechem, okay, for slope or shoulder, okay? In our translation, it says sikar. But in the Syriac translation of John, the word there used is shechem, okay? It's the mountain slope, okay, that he gave to his son. So he goes to shechem. Now, that mountain slope, shechem, is in the shadow of Mount Ebal, okay? Foot of Mount Ebal. Okay, so they're at the foot of this mountain. 
Now it's important what's going on on that mountain. And to find out what's going on that mountain, you've got to tell me who the Samaritans are. It's the last thing we're going to do, and, and then we'll, we'll keep going. Who are the Samaritans? Come on, guys. You did that. You did. There was a reason why you did salvation history. The Syrians. No, not the Syrians. They were half 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 Israelites. What? Israel. The capital of Israel. Oh, well, well, give us more. Israel. Well, wait. Israel is all of all of everything, isn't it? Yes. All of the holy land. Split. The split. Split. The kingdoms. The kingdoms. The kingdoms. The kingdoms. And what? No. All right. Two kingdoms at the at the at the civil war, the uh, civil war, the division of the kingdoms, right? Ha, remember, the son of Solomon. What was his name? Rehoboam. 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 Right? Remember, he says, "Should I rule? How should I rule?" He goes to the young men, the old men. All men say, "Be gentle with these people, and they'll follow." And be generous with them. And he goes to the young people and, they, and his friends, and they say, Rule them with an iron fist. He's like a scorpion, right? He says, The whole is terrible. Okay, anyways. Right? And the kingdom splits. And the north goes with a man named Jeroboam. 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 And the south becomes called what? Judah. Judah. Okay? And goes with Rehoboam. Okay? All right. Now, why is that important with the Samaritans? Quickly, tell me. Because they're in the north. Who are the Samaritans? Why? Where do we get Samaritans? Israel, Judah, what's... They become based on the people. Yes and no. Come on, guys. As the Pharisees to call their stuff. All right, the last thing we're going to look at today. Seven kings. Boy, we're going to have to do salvation history to see that. See you faster. Oh, hold on just a second here. Seventeen. Oh, you know what? We're not even gonna go there. No. Okay. Well, yes, yeah, you do it. That's fine. Second Kings. We'll get it. Um, we'll get. We'll come back to it though. Second Kings, chapter seventeen. Yeah, it doesn't even. Yes, yes, there it is. Okay. Remember, the Assyrians invaded from the north, right? Um, it's in what? Seven twenty-one. Yes, in seven twenty-one. They, and verse 24, the king of Assyria brought people from Babylon, Kutha, Ava, Alma, and Sarah, Sarah, whatever, right? and placed them in the cities of Samaria to so the people of Israel. That doesn't really tell us what we want to tell us. Here's the story. When they broke, and Israel was the north, and Judah was the south, okay? One of the kings established his throne city. In the city of Samaria. In fact, he named it Samaria after the guy he bought it from. Okay? You can go read that if you want in... Um, I don't have the reference in front of me. I should. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Anyways. Samaria ends up being the name for the capital city, but also for all of the northern kingdom. Okay? The Samaritans are those people in the northern kingdom who were conquered by the Assyrians... Okay? And the Assyrians, remember, when they conquer somebody, what do they do? They get the people to land out and they bring all sorts of other people in. Okay? The Samaritans were a mixture of the people in the, that were left in the land, the poor people left in the land, and these nations with, with the Assyrians brought in. Okay? And with the Assyrians. With the invasion of Assyrians, these nations brought their gods to Israel. Okay, and the Samaritan people began to worship not only Yahweh but also the pagan deities of these other people. Okay, that's who the Samaritan people are. I have one more thing I gotta say to you, and that is this: Jesus, go back to John. Sorry, I, we gotta do it. I'm sorry, we can't leave. Lock the door. <laughs> Verse 
verse 5. So he, verse chapter 4, verse 5. He had, uh, he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. And so Jesus, weary as he was with his journey, sat down beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. What time of day is it? Noon. Okay, about, about noon. Okay, middle of the day. Now let me ask you a question. What happens at noon at a well in the Old Testament? When guys show up at wells in the Old Testament, what happens? Something happens. What was that? They find wives. They find wives. Who found a wife at, at, at a well? Jacob. Oh. Jacob found a wife at, the, at a well. Who else? Abraham. Isaac. Isaac, right? The servant of Abraham found it. And Moses. All right? Aha. You got to go back and read these texts. I'll give you the references if you want to do it. Genesis chapter 24, verse 10. Genesis 24, 10. Exodus chapter 2, verse 15. 15 through uh, 21. What chapter? Exodus. Exodus 2, 15. Chapter 2, verse 15. And Genesis 29. Sorry, I'm writing so low. Genesis 29, and verse 1 through 7. Jesus has just been identified as the bridegroom in John. He shows up at a well in the middle of the day. And lo and behold, there is a woman. All right? We'll leave it at that. The soap opera will continue next. <laughs> read, please, read. Look, all you have to do is this. Read chapter 4. Just read chapter 4. We're right a little further than that. <laughs> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us. St. Spotany, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen.